It is a world where gravity is irrelevant and reality is virtual. Spad 2, Fox 2. Spad 2, Splash Bandit. When you come out of there, you're sweating and you're tired. In the military and commercial world, as well as computer gaming, flight simulation is transforming the way the world experiences aviation. It is flying without wings. Simulating flight is a multi-billion dollar industry that can take a user anywhere in the world in virtually any type of airplane without ever leaving the ground. Because of that ability, it touches every area of aviation, from the professional to the casual user. The only way non-pilots can experience a virtual slice of the real thing is through computer gaming. The ultimate challenge of working in Flight Simulator compared to other games, you know, other games deal with the fantasy world. With Flight Simulator, we're dealing with the real physical world. For a licensed pilot, simulation can be indispensable. You can't walk in off the street and learn to fly an airplane in a simulator. But if you know how to fly an airplane, a simulator will make you a better pilot. In commercial aviation, but especially in the military environment, flight sim mistakes are not just allowed, they are expected because in this type of training, the pilot is being shot at. Mayday, mayday, mayday. We've been hit by a direct fire. One six going down, one six going down. Our soldiers die in simulation, but virtual death is a learning tool. Real death is not. The simulation tools that the United States military and armed forces around the world use take many forms. Some are fully enclosed simulators which move, while others are stationary cockpits. Previous generation simulators had limited fields of view on lower resolution video screens. 21st century simulators offer vastly improved images over a much wider field of view. The virtual cockpit like this F-16 simulator manufactured by Link Simulation and Training is being deployed as the latest tool for both U.S. Air Force and Navy fighters. Like most military simulators, the cockpit is stationary and is called an FTD, flight training device. The instrumentation is exactly as it is in the airplane, and the sensory experience is made more realistic by the visual screens which virtually surround the pilot. Sometimes I'll actually feel myself crunching up like I would before a hard turn, even though I'm in a simulator. And uh, so I think it's ex very realistic and you do get lost in it, and I think that's good. The rear facets provide a pilot the ability to do what he would do in the airplane. Generally speaking, surface-to-air missiles are going to come at you from behind because they're looking at that heat source in the tail of the airplane. So being able to both see a SAM and react to a SAM by having those rear facets uh, is extremely important. There is a huge difference between a single pilot flying his aircraft and fighting in it as part of a team. On today's battlefield, pilots are almost always integrated into a larger force. The future of military simulation training is here at Langley Air Force Base, one of two bases with F-15 Distributed Mission Operations Centers, or DMOs. Four F-15 simulators are linked together to practice techniques, tactics, and procedures. What simulators can give you is realistic threat presentations on classified systems that may be uh, employed by the enemy and allow you to practice tactics that we can't go into detail. I wish I could show everyone uh, the true value that comes from those. What the military won't show anybody is the fidelity of the threat simulation that the uh, pilots fly through in these simulators. It is far, far above the level that we in the public ever get to see. That for South Group Bullseye 145 29 18,000 hostile. Boeing is the prime contractor for these multi million dollar simulators. But a number of subcontractors provide the know how to make four pilots interact with each other in real time at real simulator speed. A civilian contractor sits at the instructor operator station and runs the simulation. Have you all left? His display screens show the position of each F-15 and enemy aircraft. When the pilots are flying the sims, they have two threats that they can fly against. They have the threat computer-generated forces that are 
semi-intelligent that will react to what the F-2 pilots are doing. And we also have the capability through the threat stations or man combat stations to provide a man in the loop with an instructor sitting there and flying against the F-15s. If the enemy were very limited, we could only do nighttime visuals. Uh, we did use a lot with light points to represent cities and landing fields and given orientation points to students, but it was pretty much thick figure kind of visuals. And very, very limited in terms of what the pilot could see. By the early 1990s, daylight images became the norm, but the terrain and aircraft detail, though state of the art, left much to be desired. The hold back to virtual realism was computing power, but that began making exponential leaps by the mid-1990s. The biggest innovation has been the computing power and the graphics computing power that we have in today's off-the-shelf computers. That speed and that graphics capability allows us to paint very realistic images today in, in visual scenes for the pilots. In the multi-billion dollar simulation industry, COTS, short for computer off the shelf, has helped revolutionize flight simulation. But it all started with Link. Many of the features and things that he employed back then are still available in our simulators today. like aircraft instruments that look the same as they do in the real airplane and instrument readouts that provide the pilot the uh, information that he needs to make the decisions he needs to make. Today, the United States Army embraces simulation training because of the broad range of missions it flies. Army aviation is the air maneuver arm of the Army. We bring a lot of different things to the fight, everything from cargo helicopters that can move uh, troops and uh, external sling loads like the Chinook can move fairly heavy loads up to dump trucks around the battlefield. The utility helicopters that can be used for command and control for moving squads of troops and smaller sling loads. And of course the attack helicopters that can move to close with and destroy enemy formations, insulations, whatever needs to be destroyed. We've also got aircraft that provide uh, reconnaissance capability. Fort Rucker, Alabama is the Army's key helicopter training base where thousands of aviators are taught to fly that broad range of missions. The need to effectively coordinate all these capabilities is the reason the Army has embraced collective simulation training, in effect linking helicopter simulators to train as a unit. We've done a good job of attacking the individual and crew level simulations. We've got simulators that put the two crew members into an environment and allow them to execute their missions. The problem we've had in the past is how do we get the collective level training done without it costing us millions of dollars for a day's worth of work. Up until probably about eight years ago, we didn't really have any method of doing that. And as a result, all of that had to be done live. It is only at Fort Rucker that such sophisticated collective training is possible. The CAF Sim Center is home to eight fully reconfigurable cockpits, which can simulate various rotary wing aircraft in the Army's inventory. Cockpits in the CAF Sim are built to be low fidelity. We wanted a functionality there, but we did not want them to be switch for switch, button for button. We wanted the out the window displays. We wanted the interaction with the outside world to take precedence over what was happening in the cockpit. We want them to think in terms of conducting their, their mission as a unit, not as an individual or a crew within the cockpit. Collective sim training is not only used to rehearse possible combat scenarios. Its broader role is to teach young officers the myriad of jobs that must be performed both before and during a mission. Any collective training mission begins with the brief. Secondary mission will be the 23rd separate tank battalion. They are currently assessed to be at 85% strength. Next slide, composition 31 T-62s. We're attacking a tank battalion. Um, having a couple of tanks doesn't really ensure that we have the enemy. We may have a couple of tanks, so we have to figure out where the enemy begins, where his formation begins, and where it ends. The students will attempt to destroy the tanks using simulated Apache AH-64 gunships. In service since the 1980s, the Apache is a multi-mission combat helicopter that proved its lethality against Iraqi armor in the 1991 Gulf War. Using laser, infrared, 
and other onboard systems, air crews can find, track, and attack targets. Wood will conduct the simulation exercise from an area close to the simulators called the stealth room. What essentially I see is the battlefield from a map point of view. I know essentially where everybody's at and, and what they're doing. Uh, right next to that is what we call the stealth view, which actually it, essentially is like a camera that I can fly around the battlefield and take pictures of about anything I want to. I can take pictures from an enemy vehicle's perspective. I can attach it to an aircraft and get the aircraft's perspective. I can even attach it to a missile as the missile is flying from an aircraft to an enemy vehicle. In the training exercise, the six-ship flight is en route to locate and engage the tank battalion when Wood springs a surprise. Okay, we're going to go ahead and shoot the company commander down if you guys are ready. There he goes. Yeah, no, he's not. I told him not to say anything. He knows he's going down. All right. Okay, the aircraft flew by, so he might have seen it. Let's see if they pick it up. The down company commander's designation is Ace Six. Zero Six, this is Two One. Our Two Six element has been shot down. She reported Two Six. She reported Two Six shot down. She reported the wrong one. We always talk about the enemy is not always going to do what you want them to do. In fact, very rarely does the enemy do exactly what you want them to do. And even though they know that ahead of time, uh, it's still a surprise. When I bring a unit in to do collective training in the simulations. In some cases, I will set them up. If they make the wrong decision, they will fail. If they make the correct decision, they'll, they'll succeed. The co-pilot gunner sits in a small cubicle below the pilot out of his sight line, as in a real Apache helicopter. Hey, flight, this is Lee. Have the uh, entire tank battalion and march formation to the east of our position. You can come to a, a hold. I'm going to take them. Mark the time, 8-7 makes contact with the tanks. Using standoff munitions like the Hellfire missile, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. This is where they should figure it out. Hold. Fire. All right, there you go. Two off the rail. Three off the rail. Roger, uh, do you have any eyes on one six element? No, zero, Four off the rail. But they are leaving themselves dangerously exposed. Six, uh, six off the rail. Mark that time. Entire and Aircraft flies smoke. across EA. 532297. 532297. 16 is 11. Mayday, mayday, mayday. We've been hit by direct fire. 16 going down. 16 going down. 16. We can do things in this collective simulator that you just can't do in regular training. I can make the enemy present itself in a myriad of ways. Wood sent an enemy aircraft to shoot down AC-11. Something hit us. It might have been uh, indirect fire, but uh, we took nine tanks out and we got shot down. Meanwhile, it has taken the deputy commander several crucial minutes to discover that the mission commander is down. He's now got his hands full. 0816, go ahead. Uh, we are currently downed, uh, ready to copy the uh, grid coordinate. We are alive, we're injured, uh, with direct fire hit. Since being shot down too early holds little training value, downed aircraft are brought back to life, reconstituted in simulation jargon. Roger, five tanks destroyed. Is 2-6 uh, down? Negative, 2-6 is with you. Stress really reveals something about a unit. And when you're put in situations that are high-stress environments, I think the quality of the unit come out more in those situations than they do when, when you're not really put to the test. If we can get out there on the battlefield, or the simulated battlefield, and we can put ourselves into scenarios that they are just downright challenging. Attention all air crews, index, index, index. Put your collectives full down, return to the AAR room. When you became company commander, you were task saturated. You were just making calls left and right. And it's tough because with, with radio traffic, I couldn't even get a hold of you for anything. And I couldn't even get a. The, at the end, the BDA was, a, was an educated guy. You guys did a really good job against the DAG. Now, you didn't quite meet your. The entire mission has been recorded for playback in the after action room. This is where much of the learning takes place. It's an eye-opener in most cases. Uh, a lot of times guys had no idea that they were so exposed. It's one thing when you say something, 
But when you can back it up with camera footage, it, it just really helps drive home a point that we need to learn sometimes. Basically, one of the things I learned from that from that simulation is that when things start to go wrong, you don't. It often happens all at once. You don't have time to react, adjust, and uh, figure out what you're going to do next. You have to have a plan already before you go in there. This is what I'm going to do. Learning is a change of behavior. If you can help people to change their behavior by showing them what they did wrong, which virtual simulations allow us to do, you've done it relatively inexpensively and at less risk to that. Collective simulations linking some bases within the same branch of the military are already being done. But those are often based stateside, far from potential conflicts. Greater flexibility has now become possible with a new simulation training system just beginning delivery to the Army. AFCAP, the Aviation Combined Arms Tactical Trainer, is a six-station simulator that can be reconfigured to mix scout, airlift, and attack helicopters in the same exercise. What used to take an entire building to house is now contained in two trailers. What AFCAD allows the military to do is to take collective training and make it mobile, take it out into the field, put it down close to the front line where the pilots can learn to fly close to where they're going to fight. The secret to AFCAD, the technology that makes this mobility possible, is the result of profound advances in helmet-mounted visual display systems, HMD for short. Both the Army and industry knew that we could never have an AFCAD concept. We could never have an AFCAD success without a helmet. The visual system needed to fit in a trailerized environment, and without a helmet, we could not have provided that kind of a comprehensive visual system. You don't need that big space to have the outside visuals, the big wide displays around you. Now you've got all of that with the great fidelity presented to him in his eyes. He has the same field of view as he would in his aircraft. He's not tethered to, to fixed screens in front of him anymore. He has the field of view and a field of regard of his head movement. Where he looks, he sees the outside world. Where he sees an obstruction in his aircraft, he sees a bulkhead, a frame rail. It brings the whole environment around him just like he's in his real aircraft. So not only can he do it at home station, but it goes with him where he goes and allows him to do mission rehearsals for his entire task force when he's forward deployed, rehearse it today, and then execute on order. The actual instrument panel, though not visible on videotape, is visible to the pilot. The HMD knows exactly where the pilot's head is in space. So when he looks down to see his instruments, you see it as a black filter in front of him. To the pilot, it's transparent. He sees through that black filter that you see, sees his own instruments, and that brings the reality to him. This level of performance and image detail is possible only through recent advances in computer processing chips and video cards. The result is smaller size and greater simulation power, which is 75% less expensive than it was 20 years ago. Simulation visionaries see the day in the not too distant future when a true virtual battlefield will be possible. We're on the brink of being able to integrate Navy, like an F-18 simulator, with the F-16, the F-15 from the Air Force, with the AFCAT with all of their helicopters, with CCTT with their tank simulators, and we'll be able to execute a combined mission from various simulators all over the country without anybody having to, to fly the real plane or run the real tank. But there are challenges in getting all simulators to train in what's called the fair fight. The challenge in the fair fight is the difference in the databases amongst the different types of simulations and simulators that are out there. For example, the F-15 and the F-16, if I have a mountain in my database and it's not in the F-16's database, then there's a coordination problem when we're trying to fly and fight together. While the quality of the visuals and the sophistication of the training scenarios continue to improve, simulator cockpits and the hardware around them unlikely to see much more advancement. We're pretty much at the point where hardware is just commercial off-the-shelf technology. We pretty much can use projectors that you would use in your conference rooms or in entertainment industry. The PCs are the things you buy at the PC shop, so we pretty much closed the gap on hardware. Yeah, I think the hardware is, is, is got about as far as it can go, and, and that's good. That means that it's doing everything it should do. 
Defense industry simulation companies and armed forces officials freely admit that the computer gaming and entertainment industry is driving technology advances at a rapid pace. But those advances do not translate into realistic combat simulations. You got to give a lot of credit to the computer gamers because they generate some pretty impressive images. But in the military simulation, we have to provide an awful lot of other things. We have to provide target recognition and identification of various ranges that look like the real thing to the real pilot. We have to provide animations that give the pilot cues of anti-aircraft firing, tracer bullets, rocket flyout, flames and smoke. We have to give them uh, damage when they hit a tank and a tank explodes. We have to show them the damage of the tank. So there are an awful lot of features that need to be added as well as just making the picture look pretty and real. While the military stresses battlefield accuracy, computer gamers seek a different simulation experience. By far the largest and broadest application of flight sim software comes from computer gaming leader Microsoft which deals with tens of thousands of airfields around the world as just one component of its best-selling flight simulator series. At its Redmond, Washington studios, flight simulation artists and programmers have spent months updating 24,000 airports and enhancing their details as part of their latest flight sim release, Flight Simulator 2004. The effort that we go through to get the visual for Flight Simulator is pretty immense. We go out and we gather satellite imagery, we gather aerial imagery, we go out and actually photograph different things. And we bring all that together along with digital information and use that to create the product. Our biggest challenge really has to do with the change of time and the change of season. So Kitty Hawk, for example, uh, if you're flying during the day and it's summer, you have a gorgeous green image. What happens if you fly during the night? What happens if you fly during a different season, let's say fall? Well, we have a fall set of textures. We have a, a winter set of textures. So pretty much if you fly a Kitty Hawk 365 days a year, you'll have something on the ground that represents what really happens in real life. Millions of pilots and non-pilots use Flight Simulator, not just for flying in and out of airports, but for the experience of piloting a wide range of aircraft not possible in the real world. Although Flight Simulator users already can fly a number of aircraft in the game, the Microsoft team embraced a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity in developing its new Flight Simulator 2004, a century of flight. Create nine new simulations to honor the legendary aircraft of aviation's first century. We chose the nine historical aircraft in this version of Flight Simulator for a couple of very important reasons. One, they had to be historically significant, airplanes that played an important role in the development of aviation over the last 100 years. And then equally important, they had to be airplanes that we could get access to so that we could model them accurately. The Spirit of St. Louis is one of the most famous airplanes uh, in the history of aviation. Charles Lindbergh launched the Golden Age of Aviation in 1927, and that airplane is instantly recognizable all over the world. The J-3 is the Model T of aviation. It's the airplane that introduced the public to the world of small airplanes as opposed to airliners and military uh, airplanes. Each legendary plane simulation began with extensive research of blueprints, manuals, and aircraft handbooks. We actually go out and do a research trip with the actual aircrafts we're modeling. We go out to the aircraft, we send a crew out that sits there and photographs every instrument in the product, every element of that aircraft, whether it's the hinges or the ailerons, the cables, bell cranks, the engine, the propeller, landing gear, uh, anything that really sets that aircraft apart. At the same time, we also have a sound crew that's out there that what mics up the aircraft. We put mics inside the, inside the engine cowling. Uh, underneath the fuselage, inside the cockpit. We fly the aircraft, we do flybys. We try to make sure that we get all the different sounds that are critical to that aircraft, whether it's the gear squeaking while you land, or the, the brakes squealing, or the engine sound. The 3D artist used photographs to begin the job of making the Cub into a simulation. I take these photographs, I bring them into a digital editing software, and I need to clean them up. Modeling is the first part. Most importantly are wing shapes, uh, vertical assembly, empennage shapes. Once I am done modeling, I will texture this aircraft. 
An example of some very distinguishing items of the J3 is this clamshell-like door. What I wanted to make sure I did correctly was capture its motion as it moves up and the door opens up. I want to make sure I, I capture that detail. Once I finish the texturing, um, this is a place where I take the aircraft and I give it to another member of my team. Um, that's the test department. In the J3's case, a tester found wings that were not the right proportion. Upon fixing that, animating the plane and cockpit was next, and that underwent another tester scrutiny. When I'm testing the instrumentation on the J3 Cub or any airplane, the number one thing is accuracy. The gauges have to be accurate. For instance, the airspeed indicator, it needs to read in the correct value, if that's miles per hour, if it's knots, and it, and it actually has to, to mean what it is. The flight carrier... Underlying nearly every decision flight simulator designers made was finding the balance between detail and performance. The goal is to provide a smooth, fluid experience for the user. And we know that the amount of detail that we put in can affect that. So by incrementally adding details, seeing how they affect performance, we can find that happy medium so that the user gets good performance and a good appearance. There was considerable discussion on what details to include in the spirit of St. Louis, such as Lindbergh's hash marks to note each hour flown. We had to sit down and really make a conscious decision of exactly when in time this airplane is going to be modeled and ultimately because of the visual character that these marks added we decided we're going to model the airplane as it was at the end of the flight as if the user can then take it and recreate it. Biggest challenge with the Spirit of St. Louis is the same thing as what happened in real life. You can't see out the front of the Spirit of St. Louis. So we did what Lindbergh did. Lindbergh used a periscope. We have a periscope view. And you see a much smaller view of what's actually in front of you which will allow you to help fly the plane. The bigger challenge was making an historic plane which was hard to fly in the real world, enjoyable for both the expert and novice user. There are a lot of new users, non-pilots using the product that basically don't know how to fly an airplane and we need to make that an enjoyable experience for them. So we can dial down the realism to make it an easier, more pleasant experience for them. I had the chance to fly the EAA's uh, Spirit of St. Louis replica, which is a very faithful recreation. I've flown other vintage airplanes, I've flown other tailwheel airplanes, but I've never flown an airplane that so immediately advertised all of its bad habits. Hopefully we've captured essentially all of the behavior, but the big things that stand out are the adverse yaw, the uh, inherent lack of stability. As challenging as planes are to simulate, their appearance and performance can be clearly defined. However, upgrading the game's weather was an entirely different challenge. The thing that makes weather very challenging in a flight simulator is that there are so many different aspects to it. The art team was faced with creating hundreds of cloud patterns. And where there are clouds, there can be precipitation. If it's raining and you're in the virtual cockpit, what's the rain hitting the windshield going to look like? How big is a raindrop? We have to find an average believable size. Uh, we have movement of the precipitation across the canopy, how fast does it go? Do the drops get smaller as the airplane moves faster? Issues like this that all have to be addressed, and it's just with rain, we also model snow and similar concerns there. When we decided to create a thunderstorm experience, we started with the cloud visuals. So we created a three-dimensional looking cloud. Now you have the shading. The thunderstorm needs to be dark, especially dark at the bottom. During sunset, it needs to be lit so that it has the nice red and orange colors. If the user is flying through the thunderstorm clouds, the plane needs to jostle around and the pilot needs to feel the turbulence. We're not only doing cloud to ground lightning, but also having the lightning light up the cloud where it originated from. An almost fanatical attention to accuracy has made Flight Simulator the most popular computer game of its type in the world. With that popularity also comes a unique pressure. The ultimate challenge of working in Flight Simulator compared to other games, you know, other games deal with the fantasy world. With Flight Sim, we're dealing with the f real physical world. And it's important for us to get it right, to have the right experience that a pilot would experience in the real world. He can experience that same sensation, that same experience in Flight Simulator. We have all these groups working independently for months at a time to develop their individual assets. 
And then there's that point where the visual model is in and the audio is in and the flight model is in and we've got the weather and the new enhanced scenery. And the first time that you load up that build and see those things all working together, it's, it's amazing. It really is. Computer games are designed to be affordable flight sim entertainment. At the other end of the spectrum, and among the most expensive uses of simulation, is the commercial airline industry, where the physical accuracy of cockpit switches and hardware is imperative. A simulator must respond exactly like a real aircraft would. This is the world in which CAE has lived for 50 years. The Canadian-based company manufactures 85% of the world's commercial airline simulators. This is not a case of being close. This training is fully regulated uh, by the authorities both in North America and Europe uh, as well as in Asia. And so the standards that we have to achieve, the level D, the top standard for a full flight simulator is identical even to the touch of the buttons above the pilot's head. It takes over a year to build that kind of precision into a full flight simulator. Each stands over three stories tall and contains over a thousand miles of wiring and an extremely advanced visual display system. Unlike most military simulators, which are stationary, full flight simulators move on multiple axes. What it does is allow a pilot to go through his normal, abnormal and emergency procedures and actually feel what it is to have turbulence, to see the visuals in it and have an anticipation of what it is that they're actually going to see out there, what it is that they're going to feel and what it is they're going to experience in terms of the actual systems on board the aircraft. So what it does is it replicates the seat of the pants effects uh, in terms of the pilot. The out-the-window visuals the pilot sees are as important as the instrumentation and the feel of simulated flight. So the challenge in level D visual simulation is to be able to produce an image that's very precise and accurate so the pilot, when he's 12 nautical miles back from the runway, he can pick up that approach lighting system with a great deal of precision and come in and land the aircraft. To get there, we, have, we use anywhere from 50 to 200 computer graphics chips spread anywhere from 3 to 15 video channels to cover a full 180 degrees as seen from the pilot. It's about the equivalent of 500 Pentiums running in parallel to give you that kind of computational power to put up on a screen. Projectors bounce the image off an ingenious mirror system made of a thin mylar sheet stretched flat across the inside of this visual bowl, which is positioned just a few feet outside the cockpit window. The price of the visual system is in excess of one million dollars. However, that cost produces exceptional detail. It's important because it gives the pilot a sense of realism during his training. And when you're conducting an approach down to minimums, when he breaks out, the pilot has to be able to see the lights. And when he sees the lights of the runway environment, then he can make a decision as to whether he's going to land or whether he's going to go around. Software designers put most of their effort into creating level D detail visuals, where they are most critical, at and around airports. We start off with terrain elevation data from the National Imagery and Mapping Agency, or NEMA, in, in the U.S. Then we drape it with satellite imagery of varying resolutions. The next step is around the areas of interest, such as the, the runway and the tarmac, is that we lay down 2D areas where we put a much finer texture, such as the gravel pitch in asphalt or in concrete. We then add taxi markings and approach lighting systems to guide the pilot and the crew into land at the airport. The final stage is that we build 3D models and we lay the 3D models down exactly at the right location at the airport of the area that's being designed. In fact, these models can be positioned down to a tenth of an inch anywhere on the globe, so the emphasis is on accuracy of the build of the database. The combination of satellite terrain mapping and faster computers has allowed advances in visuals only dreamed of a decade ago. If you're flying a plane, it's one thing to see a mountain flat against the wall, but if you actually see the height of the mountain, then you know exactly what it is you have to fly over. It just gives you more accuracy in terms of the flight training experience because you're not flying over a flat photograph. You're actually seeing with 3D sensation uh, 
the height of the terrain. As daytime visuals have improved, so have those simulating airports at night, as the approach to Innsbruck, Austria shows. Well, when we go into Innsbruck uh, these days at night uh, in a simulated package, you're going to see all kinds of detail when you break out of the clouds. You even see traffic running down the roads, and if you look real close, you can see the headlights at one end and the uh, red lights for the taillights at the other end. So the detail is getting quite extraordinary these days. And that detail in visuals, cockpit fidelity, and performance comes at considerable expense. The cost of each Level D full-flight simulator is $12 million. The full-flight simulator is but one of several simulators airlines use to achieve proficiency at an unprecedented level. ECAM status check. Approach briefing complete. Preliminary landing checklist complete. Thank you. Yes, sir, one to maintain 1,600. Yes, sir, one down to 1,600. 1,600? In the airline world, all commercial pilots now receive their training in the simulator. When they go to a new aircraft type, they do all their training in the simulator. The first time that they fly the airplane is when they actually fly a revenue flight. That's the end result. To get there, airlines like U.S. Airways begin with classroom and computer-based training followed by extensive procedures instruction in a flight training device. Three to three and a half hours a day is spent in the FTD. The FTD allows us to do actual aircraft simulation in a non-motion, non-visual simulator. About 70% of what we can do in the flight simulator we can do in the FTD. All right, you're clear to start engines. Blow the line. Okay, fuel panel. Set. Cross bleed. Auto. Cabin signs. On. Parking brake. On. MCDU. Set. Departure review. Complete. We're down to the line. It's not just numerous normal procedures that are learned, but also non-normals, such as an engine fire. Engine two fire. You have the aircraft? I have the aircraft. ECAM actions. Engine two fire. Thrust lever two idle. Our guard number one, idle. Engine master two, off. Our guard number one, off. Engine two, fire push button, push. Our guard number one, push. The engine fire procedure allows us to go into the flight training device engine and one train after nine seconds and evaluate discharge. the actual procedure of handling that non-normal and really not have the need for the full visual or, or the full motion that we'd have in the flight simulator. Engine 2 bleed, pack 2, yellow engine 2 pump. Clear status? Clear status. Okay, well done. Good transfer of control and good execution of ECAM. The final steps in transition training are to add motion and visuals in the full flight simulator. It's so real that when you're in the simulator, you are flying the airplane. You have a visual that looks almost like it would in the real Check. aircraft. You have systems that operate exactly as they would in the real aircraft. You do your training just like you would the real aircraft. U.S. Airways, as do many other airlines, has custom visual databases of airports into which it often flies. Our custom visual database at uh, Reagan National allows us to do specialized training at Washington Airport. It's the nation's capital. It's a lot of restricted airspace. It's a unique airport for arrivals and departures, and we want to be able to give our pilots the benefit of additional training at that airport. Spoilers. Even taxiing to the gate that looks just like it does at Reagan National. Oftentimes we're asked what's missing from simulation training as opposed to training the real airplane. And really, that's not a good question. We do much more than we're able to do in the real airplane and simulators because of the capability. Simulation systems today have vastly improved the quality of training we can do. Because we can do better training, we can operate more safely as an airline. What we have available to us today allows us to give our pilots better experience, better capability, and ultimately better safety. And that's what airline travel is all about. Computer advances have prompted a revolution in flight simulation in all its applications. The question is, where might it be in five years for training and gaming? I think if we look five years ahead, you're going to see not only an improvement in things like uh, graphics, 
but uh, better sound or wider fields of view that will make the link between uh, the virtual and the reality uh, even more profound. On the surface, little will change in the commercial use of simulation over the next five years because they're using it almost to the maximum extent today, but the quality of training will improve markedly. Currently, I would say we probably do 13 to 18 percent of our flight training in the simulations. Under Flight School 21, we've been told that we have to go to 40 percent in virtual simulations. That's going to take an entirely new suite of simulations that are more capable than the ones we currently have on hand. I think if the Wright brothers were alive today, they'd be fascinated by computer technology. And I think they'd be sitting in front of a computer screen with a joystick in their hands. A hundred years ago, the Wright brothers had to learn by trial and error that man could fly. Today, you could take off from New York and fly halfway across the world to Sydney and never leave the simulator. Coming up next, history calls upon its top aviators to defend freedom from the sky. Fly with the fearless pilots who dared to accept history's most intense missions. Next on the Discovery Wings Channel.